Today's presentation is all about how AI is changing creativity. I'm Caleb, the co-founder and CEO of Curious Refuge. Shelby is the other co-founder of Curious Refuge. Ike is actually in the chat as well. Ike is our community manager at Curious Refuge and uh, just does an amazing job with helping us to grow our new community. So I wanted to say hello, and I thought the only appropriate way to do that was to have a six-finger hand. thought it's just, you know, totally appropriate for artificial intelligence. And to kick things off, I wanted to show you guys a video project that I put together entirely using Pika Labs. And this is actually a little bit older, so Pika has improved the results from even what you're going to see here. This came out, I think it was late September, early October. And basically, we had a project, like a presentation to give out here in LA, and the, the prompt was basically to create a fictitious Star Wars concept, and we only had eight hours to put it together <laughs> before we had to present. So this is the result. I think he's near. Hello again, Lisa Ratano. I need the artifact. Tunoka, this. So you don't want to play nice? What if I let the Empire know about your illegal operation? I think he's over here. Vale. Jost Levza. You can tell Vader about this one, not me. <laughs> so uh, whenever I was working on that project, I was absolutely blown away with all of the, the quality of the results that I was getting from Pika. The renders, the atmospherics were just absolutely incredible. And it really, uh, for me, helped to showcase the, uh, the future of, of filmmaking. So I thought that was a really fun uh, project. So here's our agenda. Here's what we're going to cover very quickly. I want to save plenty of time at the end for some quick Q&A. And if there is, is any questions that you have, we'll, we'll save those to the end. If anything goes uh, catastrophically wrong, we have some folks that will uh, let me know. Okay, cool. So let's get started here. So let's first talk about what is Curious Refuge? So Curious Refuge was started by Shelby and I. We have a ton of experience in running online education for artists and uh, technical creatives. We actually used to work at a company called School of Motion, which is an online animation school. It was incredibly fun teaching tools like After Effects, Cinema 4D, and uh, Adobe Illustrator, and uh, just helping you know motion designers in their craft. Uh, more recently, up until about seven months ago, we were working for an online visual effects school. So the VFX school um, was uh, called Rebelway, and we taught artists uh, how to use Nuke and Houdini, Unreal Engine, like these really high-end uh, VFX tools. And uh, it was really awesome because uh, we were able to train um, the uh, artists behind the nine of the last 10 Academy Award winners for visual effects. Uh, we uh, taught the team that worked on the water simulations. We taught them how to do water simulations for the way of water. Uh, that won uh, best VFX for was it last year or the year before? One of the two. Uh, so really fun work over there. And then uh, AI uh, started to pop up. So of course, you know, we were all captivated by some of the awesome AI projects like uh, Harry Potter. Valenciaga, which I think is just, uh, it continues to be uh, just a hilarious uh, concept. But it was when I saw this video that I realized that, whoa, AI generated video is keeping an audience captivated and creating conversation points in a way that, you know, images alone weren't up to that point. And so I wanted to do an experiment. And so in that experiment, I basically said, I'm going to use my laptop computer, so a very basic computer that most people have access to, um, and uh, I'm going to use AI tools to put together a film concept. And if you can put together a film concept using artificial intelligence, that definitely has big implications for the future of filmmaking. And the result was uh, Star Wars by Wes Anderson. This is the second video I put out that was uh, Lord of the Rings by Wes Anderson. And I wasn't really prepared for how um, big of an impact these projects would have on the industry. You know, looking back, this was like seven or eight months ago. 
uh, you know, th there's definitely things that I would uh, try to improve, but generally speaking, uh, they're, they're fun projects and, you know, highlight, you know, using mid journey and just some other like simple tools to uh, do simple parallaxing, simple movements. And it really kickstarted a larger conversation about the role of artificial intelligence in storytelling. And so that project went mega viral. Uh, we got written about in basically every news publication. Uh, we had like news, uh, uh, I guess, uh, crews. Yeah, news crews. <laughs> Don't know why I couldn't find that word. Uh, coming out to our house and uh, my dogs would like bark at them. It was like a whole thing. Uh, and it was really fun to kickstart a conversation about what the future of storytelling would mean. And what we found is that these tools, especially through some of those early uh, tests, were absolutely going to be the foundation for how we tell stories in the future. And we wanted to empower everyone to tell their stories, not just a select few and not just people that were well networked and things like that. And so we wanted to create the world's first home for AI storytellers. And so we uh, launched Curious Refuge. We... Um, launched a course called AI Filmmaking, and then we actually just this last week launched a course called AI Advertising with Dave Clark, who is an incredibly talented filmmaker. And we really want to be a home for folks uh, who are telling stories in the AI space to uh, find encouragement, inspiration, and uh, just generally level up their skills. So we have a ton of resources. Ike actually does handle a lot of these things. So we have an AI events board, jobs, a gallery where we uh, curate the best AI projects. We do weekly uh, AI film news. We have competitions. Uh, maybe we can do one with Pika Labs in the future. Uh, just throwing that seed out there, Pika. And uh, we, of course, have courses as well. So now let's talk about what is happening with artificial intelligence. So it's really funny because if you go to Time Magazine, uh, in 2022, they said that AI was uh, one of the best inventions of uh, 2022, and then just a few months later, they also said that AI might be the end of humanity. So if you go to uh, news outlets, you're going to get very conflicting uh, results, depending on who you talk to. And really, if we look at adoption of artistic mediums and communication mediums throughout history... We see the cycle again and again. I call it the hater wheel, and uh, this is what Midjourney created when I typed in hater wheel, which I, I think is pretty great, actually. It uh, kind of reminds me of Triv Trivia Murder Party. I don't know if you guys have ever played that game. It's great. It's on Jackbox. Uh, so let's take a look through history, because I think it'd be helpful to create a context of uh, artificial intelligence and, and creative adoption throughout uh, history. Uh, and the way the creator wheel or the hater wheel works, basically step one is you criticize a new storytelling medium for not being authentic. Step two, you use division to increase your own personal notoriety. Step three, you realize you were wrong about the future a little too late. You wait until people forget that original harsh stance, and then you use the new medium to share your stories and ideas with the world. We're seeing that like crazy right now. Uh, so let's go back to the invention of the print press. Uh, this guy, Johannes, uh, basically said that uh, only a scribe working on parchment ensures that his work would last more than a century. Uh, but ironically, we only know about Johannes's quote because it was printed out inside of a book. Uh, this guy named Charles said that photography is basically the stupidity of the multitude and, uh, you know, it's corrupting artwork. And, you know, ironically, a few years later, he posed for his photograph. I'm assuming this is his smile based on his quote, but I'm not entirely sure. Uh, Mir uh, Maria uh, Mans uh, said that television provides little sustenance for the mind and the imagination. And then just a few years later, she begins to share her thoughts on the BBC. And David Lynch, who is an incredibly talented filmmaker, amazing guy, uh, said that digital filmmaking was a great sadness for him. But then just a few years later, uh, his new show, Twin Peaks, was shot entirely on, you guessed it, digital cameras. So it's very normal for people to have reservations to new storytelling mediums. Uh, we don't like um, focusing too much on uh, the negativity. While it's helpful to have great conversations, we want to push storytelling forward and empower everyone to tell awesome stories. And uh, one example of that, I'm going to play this back here. Hopefully the audio is okay for you guys. Uh, this is a project our team put together uh, this last week um, about the Legend of Zelda. And I, I hope you guys enjoy. Legend of Zelda. 
Legend tells of an object of great power, capable of granting any wish to the one that holds it, shattered to pieces, and lost to the march of time. A tall tale. It was, until a piece was found. There is one who has the courage to save us. Zelda, you must find Link? I trust everything I've heard about you is true. <laughs> what? This summer, experience a blockbuster over 35 years in the making. If we're to have any chance, we must unite the world against Ganon. Gorons? Where were the Gorons when Lanayu fell? <laughs> ah, yes, a fair point. We're with you then. Wait, can you understand him? Starring. Orlando Bloom as Link, Miranda Otto as Zelda, Vigo Mortensen as King Rome, Kate Blanchett as the Great Fairy, Andy Serkis as the OK Fairy, and Owen Wilson as Ganondorf. Wow. The Legend of Zelda, directed by Peter Jackson. So that project was put together by Mike Fink, who was our head of entertainment at Curious Refuge. And uh, I think he knocked it out of the park. I love the uh, the bird talking. I just can't believe Pika Labs is so amazing. Uh, I'm not just saying that because they invited me to come on. Like, I can't, cannot believe uh, it did that animation. It was really incredible. Uh, so let's talk about what is happening specifically with creativity. So when you're, whenever you're thinking about artificial intelligence, whenever you are working on a creative project, you know, you are no longer labor alone. So focusing on the uh, specific technical ways in which you have to share your creative vision and get it out there um, is less of a concern. And what is more of a concern now is curating that specific story to match your creative vision. So generally speaking with artificial intelligence tools, your creativity has been multiplied by 50 times using artificial intelligence. There's still a ton of creativity and work that goes into creating a really good AI project, uh, but your capacity for the quality and the overall uh, direction on that AI project has never uh, been more customizable and more available to you um, as an artist. So in the past, you know, you might have spent a lot of time learning a specific tool or software. For example, me with After Effects, I spent a long time learning the tool, creating tutorials and, you know, making most of my career around a, a single software and just getting really proficient. But in the future, what's much more important is you developing art direction skills and being able to look at many different outputs and pick and choose the specific renders and the specific uh, outputs that can help to progress your story forward. And it's really cool because these stories are being seen by people around the world. This is a project that a student inside of Curious Refuge put together. <clears throat> Excuse me. Her name is Amina, and um, this project uh, she put together in a week, and it actually premiered out here in Hollywood at the Sony lot recently. Uh, it was written about in the LA Times, and Amina has so much work now, uh, she can hardly uh, keep up with it. And she was not doing a ton of filmmaking before artificial intelligence tools started popping up. She just had really amazing art direction skills. So these opportunities are opening up to people around the world, and it doesn't matter where you live. So let's talk about how AI is shaping creativity. Obviously, if we take a walk down memory lane here, you know, the early versions of tools like Midjourney were not so good, right? They were interesting, and I had a lot of fun messing around with them, but they weren't, you know, uh, screen ready, photorealistic by any capacity. And uh, if we kind of follow the progression here, when Midjourney 4 came out, which I believe was late last year, um, we were able to see, well, I guess the previous year, 2022, uh, we were able to see that we're starting to get some photorealism. And now with tools like Midjourney 6, the results are absolutely uh, photorealistic and amazing. 
And like I said before, iteration is faster than ever. And now you're getting creative feedback in only a matter of seconds and not a matter of days. You know, if you needed a concept, if we go back there for a sci-fi film and, you know, in the past you would have to, um, you know, hire uh, uh, a model, you'd have to do art direction for your scene, you'd have to take the photos, edit the photos, color grade, all of those things just to get the one photograph that probably would not be as good as this photograph here. So uh, you're, you're getting faster iteration. And the cool thing is you can also begin to conceptualize some things that are um, a little more in the realm of emotion and thought as opposed to a uh, specific um, logical direction. And this has actually been really big for people um, in the counseling world that, that I've heard of uh, counselors using uh, artificial intelligence uh, to generate imagery for people so they could actually express their emotions uh, for the first time whenever they have trouble uh, putting words to it. So, for example, if we take this, uh, you know, we want to create an architectural visualization for Curious Refuge, uh, like an online home. Uh, we have these amazing renders. I would want to uh, live in all of these. And the cool thing is using AI tools, um, you know, in, in MidJourney, we have these repeater codes that we can repeat uh, renders over and over again. In MidJourney, you can, um, or I'm sorry, in Pico Labs, you can reprompt and, and re-roll and have multiple videos rendering at a time. And so we can get tons of outputs, right? So we have tons of options that we can pick from. And these options aren't just good. They're really great. And, you know, hypothetically, we could run these through Magnific to get even more detail. And, you know, we could totally just like sit here on the couch, drink some coffee and uh, hang out with uh, our dogs. I, I think this is a really cool like geodesic dome. And I, I think it's living in the avatar, like the Pandora universe, uh, like the floating mountains, I think are in the background. I'm not entirely sure there. So we could also extend this over to video. So, you know, let's say that you need a shot of a person drinking a soda in a sci-fi futuristic world. Let's say that, it, you know, it's just uh, some B-roll or uh, uh, an establishing shot for a film that you are working on. Well, if you go to a stock footage library, this is what you get. It's not a lot, right? Uh, but if we go into uh, image generation tools, this one is mid-journey here, we can get some fantastic results. And the cool thing is, of course, you can vary those results and pick and choose and art direct further until you get the image you want. And then we can use tools like Pika Labs. Uh, I generated this one in uh, Pika whenever it was primarily on Discord. Of course, you can use the new Pika um, in the desktop version uh, to generate the motion. And now we have uh, some slight movement here with this guy in the soda. And, you know, the creative potential extends far beyond AI filmmaking alone as well. So I have a friend who is a fashion designer. Uh, she uh, worked on a, uh, a dress uh, back and forth with Midjourney. So Midjourney created some ideas for what her dress could be like. Um, she actually put that dress together um, and uh, had a fashion show and premiered her dress. And uh, we're actually going to be working with them to do an AI generated fashion show in London, hopefully this year. We'll let you know more about that as uh, we figure it out. So the question is, how can you stay relevant? You might uh, feel like this woman here, like, oh my gosh, like things are changing every day. How in the world can I keep up with all of these changes? I totally understand. Uh, we have multiple staff members on our team that help us to stay up to date uh, with these tools. Uh, but the best resources I've really found can be newsletters. So there's quite a few different newsletters out there. You have AI Valley, AI Artist, uh, the Curious Refuge newsletter, uh, is uh, a weekly newsletter that we send out that just has like all the AI filmmaking news you need to know. Uh, there's the Neuron, uh, Futurepedia. There, there's quite a few of them out there. Uh, and YouTube, of course, is a fantastic resource. So Matt Wolf is a fantastic resource for all things AI. Tim at Theoretically Media is a great friend of ours. He has a fantastic channel. And then, like I said, we do our weekly film news um, at Curious Refuge as well. And then obviously going uh, to uh, social media platforms, Twitter uh, is a great tool for um, looking at kind of what is trending in the AI world. So uh, we have Nicholas Newbert, uh, Pika Labs, uh, Curious Refuge. You can't, you know, if you go on to uh, uh, Twitter just for a few minutes, you'll, you'll find some fantastic um, demos and examples of the latest AI tools. And then we also have a gallery over at Curious Refuge where we um, you know, curate the, the latest uh, film projects and, uh, you know, you can use that for your creative inspiration. And generally speaking, I say become a lifelong learner, you know, growing in your skills, being willing to to grow and progress um, is 
going to be more important than ever before, but you know, you're know you already an early adopter in these tools. And so I think you already understand that. Um, and so you know, I, I would like to offer 10% uh, off. So if any of you decide to join us uh, for our AI filmmaking course or AI advertising course, you can use the code PICA10 um, at checkout and uh, that will give you 10% off our upcoming January, uh, our upcoming February session, which opens up on January 31st. So that's the end of the slideshow presentation. Now let's get into the nitty gritty demo here. So I want to walk you through the exact process of how I put together um, AI film concepts. Obviously, we're not going to be able to get into everything, uh, but I will try to get into a lot of the uh, tools and techniques that I use. Um, if you have any questions, uh, please save them towards the end, and uh, I will cover them. So let's get started. So let's start from the scratch, So, or from the, the very beginning. So whenever I'm working on an AI project, I almost always like to use ChatGPT as a springboard for ideas. And that's really what where ChatGPT thrives. Writing scripts alone, not so great. Sometimes it can be helpful uh, for marketing projects or if you have you know shorter scripts. But generally speaking, it's a creative assistant. Think of it as someone you can bounce ideas off of. So for example, I wanted to put together a video demo for you guys here uh, for the Pika Labs presentation. And um, I was like, I want something with animals. That sounds fun. Uh, and I, it came up with all of these ideas here, and I liked the seahorse idea. And so I went to Google and started doing some research about seahorses, and apparently there's this cute little yellow seahorse called a dwarf seahorse, and I was like, I gotta see that uh, in video form. And so uh, basically, then you need to create the images for your projects. Now, you can use text to video, but I do find that using images first and then converting them into video can tend to be a little bit better experience, not only because it's a little bit faster, but also the consistency is a lot uh, easier to control as well. So uh, we'll go over here to, uh, actually, instead of going to Discord, because I don't want to uh, close out our uh, Discord channel, I'm just going to take you over to uh, my mid-journey uh, feed here. And you can see, uh, here are some results. I, I didn't get into a lot of prompting here. I just said a yellow dwarf seahorse, and you can see that most of these images they seem kind of the same. They're a little boring. I wouldn't say they're very cinematic. It just looks like, you know, someone took a macro image of a seahorse and then, you know, uh, uploaded it. It's cute, but it's not very cinematic. And that's where we get into prompt trees. And there might be a, a better word for this, maybe long tail prompts, things like that. But whenever you are prompting a cinematic scene, typically you want to go way beyond just a simple, uh, you know, prompt like, you know, a seahorse or something like that. You want to actually give direction to your image generation tools that will give you specific um, results that are more repeatable and the style can be more consistent. And again, whenever you are working with AI tools, iteration is very important. So don't think that you're just going to like type in one prompt and like it's going to be the perfect shot. The next prompt is going to be the perfect shot. Nothing like that. It's it's always a back and forth. And so for this specific uh, scene, I said a cinematic still of a yellow dwarf seahorse shot on disposable camera with Fuji superior film, wide shot coral reef. You can see that we now have that in our scene. I really liked the color grading on this specific shot and I liked the imperfections. I like whenever you have some of like the bokeh imperfections and like some of the halation in uh, the, the out of focus parts. It makes it seem a little bit more um, realistic. And so there we go. Now we have an image. So now we need to up res that image because natively, whenever you get an image from some of these AI tools, the resolution usually isn't much more beyond like 1100 pixels. Um, and I like giving um, the AI video generators the most sharp, you know, the nicest image quality possible. So I have the, uh, the project here. Oh, one second, let me find my folder. There we go. Uh, so I have my mid-journey image here. You can see that, um, you know, it's looks good, but it's a, it's a little small. It's only 800 pixels tall, so that's not even uh, full 1080p HD. And I'm using a tool called Gigapixel here. So Gigapixel is my favorite image up tool. Uh, there's kind of a competition right now. There's a competition between Magnific and Gigapixel. Gigapixel has been on the scene a while. 
um, they use AI to up res images and we can zoom in here. I only have this at times two, but you can already see that this one is much less pixelated. Hopefully um, that quality is coming through here. And you can see that it stays very true to the nature of the lens that was used um, to, well, I guess the hypothetical lens that was used to uh, shoot the scene. So it, it's much more realistic um, in some of the, 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 the glow in the, the lens qualities that you would expect to see. And uh, I, I really love using it. It's very fast um, and it's a one-time purchase and they have updates. Actually, uh, just like two days ago, they created an update and they have an even more advanced um, algorithm for um, their standard in high fidelity, which is super exciting. This is the stuff I, I geek out about, guys. I apologize. Um, and then uh, Magnific is uh, the other tool that's making the rounds. If you've seen some of those like Twitter videos of people like zooming into a cheeseburger infinitely, uh, they've been using Magnific. Uh, basically, the tool allows you to really dramatically increase the scale. You can go up to 16 times, which would make this image, I don't know, like 10,000 pixels wide. Um, and you can see, like, if we zoom in here, um, the the sharpness is really there. So you can see that this seahorse now, uh, like, the, I don't know what you call this, the, like, underwater snow on his face or, like, the details here um, are really, really detailed. So Magnific can be great, especially if you have highly detailed. I found that nature shots work really well, urban environments, things like that. In this specific instance, I don't love Magnific um, as our option because you can see in the bokeh hopefully this is coming through there's like these dots that kind of make it look like it was a, a print from like a magazine or maybe even a painting um so we're not getting that kind of realistic bokeh background it's actually interpreting the pixels as um as dots there so in this specific instance uh magnific was not the best use um for us so i actually ended up rolling with the gigapixel image so we have Magnific and then Gigapixel here. So we can zoom in and, you know, we have tons of detail. So now it's time to hop over to our, um, our video generation tool. So we'll go over to Pika Labs here. Um, and I'll just walk with you through. I don't want to have to wait on the renders. So I'll walk with you uh, through my, um, uh, my thought process here. So first I uploaded just the image alone. And I had Pika basically create the video. Uh, let me download that. Take a look at it here. So I had Pika create the video. You can see that it has kind of the slow zoom in. It looks pretty realistic. Um, but I want to have a bit more control over the scene. Uh, I found that with Pika, um, if you don't type in a prompt, uh, sometimes it does default to that slow push in, which is fine, but you don't want all your shots to be slow push in. So I always recommend uh, prompting a little further. Uh, so now for this instance, uh, the next one, I said a seahorse floats underwater. And uh, we now have this result of a seahorse underwater. But you can see that we're kind of getting that weird distortion. You see, like it looks like we're shooting the seahorse from like above a pool. And so that's not quite ideal. And so again, it's always a back and forth here. So I went in and I prompted the uh, the same thing again. Um, with uh, turning down the motion a little bit. And we got this result. Okay, looks pretty good. But I think this distortion's a little much. Uh, and I actually think that some of that, um, the, the flickering that's happening um, is probably uh, due to the word underwater as opposed to in the ocean. So I changed my prompt to in the ocean. And this is the result we're getting wanted a little bit more movement. And so I increased the movement uh, just a little bit. And um, once I had a an actual render that looked um, somewhat in line with what I was hoping to get, I then went in and reprompted it uh, three to four times just to get the exact um, result that I was looking for. Again, this is very common. Uh, AI generations are all about iterations. You're not going to get the perfect thing on the first go. And now we have the shot of this cute little seahorse underwater. So now we have the seahorse. We'll download that to our computer. And now we need to get more uh, resolution because obviously the resolution from Pika, it's not like 4K or anything really big. Always like up my video and then um, uh, scaling it down so that we can get as much sharpness as possible. In order to do that, I'm going to use Topaz Video AI, which is um, my favorite tool for getting maximum resolution. Uh, so we have uh, this clip from Pico that looks super great. And 
basically inside of Topaz Video, it's very similar to Gigapixel. It's all the same company. And we can go in here and change this to a 4K output. So we're getting much more resolution. And um, you can go in here and adjust some of these settings. I like turning down the recover detail to zero. And then um, for the AI model, I like keeping it at the Proteus model. And they actually just updated this Proteus model, I think yesterday. So the quality is even better uh, than the results that we were getting before. I'm not going to render this because uh, it can be a little intense on your computer. And I know I'm like recording my screen and presenting. So I don't want to, uh, you know, cancel this uh, presentation. But I did do this render yesterday. And I just want to show you what the results are like. So you can see that we have this beautiful 4K footage now. And we could drag and drop this into our project. So that is the, the process of creating the actual video. Now, whenever you're working on a video, just a quick tip, you know, a lot of times image generation tools can give you these very typical, I would call these like medium shots. I know for the seahorse, this would be a wide shot, but but it can give you, you know, the shots, the typical uh, composition, you know, where your subject is cut off at about their navel. And, you know, one thing I want to encourage you to do is to really think about shot variety whenever you are working on a project, um, it's, you know, core filmmaking concepts, you know, making sure to set your establishing shots, you know, have details that reinforce um, the, the emotion and the thoughts that your um, your audience is supposed to uh, to feel and, and to, to really vary um, the the quality and not just go with just the exact uh, images that you get from your tools um, on the first iteration. And then, of course, music and sound effects go a long, long way. Um, my favorite tool for creating, uh, for, for using music on my projects is Artlist. Um, they have great uh, sound effects, great music, um, and they also have footage and, and templates and things like that. So, yeah, generally speaking, we then throw all of those uh, assets into a timeline in a tool like Adobe Premiere Pro. And, you know, it's a back and forth process. There's absolutely um, a, a, an iteration to this. And it takes time and refinement. And it's not like you just type in a prompt and boom, you have a video, um, you know, finessing it and, and kind of polishing it at various aspects is, is what it's all about. And then I will say as well, you know, uh, inside of Pika, they have um, the in-painting tool, which is really helpful. I also like using Photoshop for in-painting. For example, this is the header image on our website. Um, but I noticed that, like, I wanted text here, but it was so bright. Um, I actually used uh, generative fill inside of Photoshop to uh, remove that from the scene. So there are all sorts of tools that are available to you as artists, and um, they are uh, very helpful. So there you go. That's uh, the quick presentation. I hope you guys enjoyed that. Uh, now we can get into some Q&A. So Nicola is first. I'm a very enthusiastic fan of Pika. And there's two questions that I, I had. Uh, do you think Pika has, I, I see it a lot of, a low mo movements on Pika. Do you think that we can brought like more movements? Like if I want to raise an arm and something like that. And the second question, the the people on the chat already answered me that you won't know it. The, the, the API is coming soon of Pika. If we get we could uh, generate videos with the API and not on your Discord or on um, the website. This is the two questions that I had. Yeah, well, so it looks like Jesse said in the, the chat that the API is not available just yet. She can speak to that. Um, but for the, the more complex movements, you know, th that's one of the challenges with, with artificial intelligence. Um, there are many iterations that you have to go through. Like, for example, in that Star Wars scene, I don't know if you remember, there was like a, kind of like establishing shots with like a market of people walking around. And I think there was like one robot who like lifts his head and like looks around. Uh, it took us maybe five to 10 iterations of that before we got what we were looking for. You know, it, are these AI tools perfect right now? You know, no, it's it's a work in progress. But um, I, I would say, like, try to, to iterate um, and, you know, uh, try to, to get uh, what you're looking for. And the interesting thing is just as filmmakers, working around creative limitations is a big part of the creative expression. And so sometimes if you can't have, like, a really big dynamic movement, like, Let's talk about what you can do to break down that movement. Like if it's like a big hug, right? Like someone's like going in with like both arms and it's like, there's no way you could ever get that. Like maybe you show like close up of the face and like the embrace, like you show their shoes, like getting close to each other, the hand on the back. 
and it still emotionally conveys a hug without um, having to show the entire gigantic action. So uh, just a thought there. there there's creative uh, challenges that you do run into, and sometimes you have to work around them in, in AI. And if you uh, don't get the results, you think it's more about the image that we prompted or the prompt text? Or it's a little bit of both? Yeah, it's like, it, that, that's a great question. It, it can be a little bit of both, honestly. Um, the Sometimes I find, for whatever reason, an image is like, just isn't working. <laughs> like, And there's no like reason why it just like isn't working. That's totally fine. Um, I, I found that the prompts... The, the image that you're putting in matters more than the prompts that, that you're typing in typically when it comes to those those big movements. So, you know, if it's not working with okay. uh, one image, you can try another. <laughs> okay, thanks for the answer. Yeah, thank you so much. All right. <laughs> All right, so we'll go to uh, Rhapsody next. Hello. Hey there. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, amazing. Um, thank you for your great presentation. I think it's really uh, enlightening to see what other people are doing with these tools. Um, what I wanted to ask you is a general perspective question. Like what I find great with these AI filmmaking tools is that they allow for a lot of explorative filmmaking where you don't know what your outcome will be uh, until you start. But um, how important would you think is still like the let's say, old school method of starting with a script, organizing what you are going to do, and have you maybe some best practices? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thanks for your question. I appreciate that. Um, there's, yeah, there's a lot to be said, honestly. And, and when we are, we are thinking about um, AI filmmaking, there really are two paths. There's, you know, one path that is using AI to supplement the existing filmmaking pipeline. Uh, you know, and so like just helping writers to have more ideas so that they can like go out and like write scripts or, you know, concept artists to get more concepts out there to like really um, get the director's vision. And then there's completely creating AI films like that are circumventing that process entirely. Those are two different paths and AI is helpful for both of them. Um, I will say that, you know, at least just from the perspective of conversations that I have out here in Hollywood and in a lot of the studios that we collaborate with, um, AI is absolutely um, a, a tool that is being used by uh, creative professionals, um, especially, like you said, in the pre-production side. So creating film concepts, um, you know, I, I was talking with an executive the other day and he was saying how going forward, it's now mandatory to have a trailer for your film whenever you're pitching it. So, you know, just having a pitch deck alone is not going to be the norm. Like it's going to be expected that you use AI, stock footage, combination of multiple things together um, to create um, a, a pitch for your film. And so, you know, I... That's I, very interesting. Yeah, it is. It is. Um, and there's a really good example. Dave Clark um, put together um, like a hybrid trailer the other day that uh, used footage that he had shot uh, with AI uh, video that that he rendered, I think using Peak Labs. And um, he, he combined those together to create a concept, which I think was very interesting. So... So yeah, I would say that increasingly um, the scope is going from pre-production and concepting alone to post-production as well. Um, and especially with a lot of the, the audio uh, innovations with, with cleaning up audio, with doing voice to voice. Um, I was talking with uh, some folks the other day. There was a Netflix film that premiered last month. And uh, I don't know if I can say what it was, but uh, the the lead actor um, basically uh, missed a line. They like the, the audio got messed up, and they needed them to speak, but they weren't available to do ADR. And so they used uh, Eleven Labs to uh, generate their voice, and they said that it wasn't good. It was absolutely perfect, and it went into the project. So, um, oh, pre yeah, pre production, post production AI tools are being used across the board. So, yeah, I think those will also get very interesting when we uh, like with Pika's um, fill-in feature, for example, when we use generative fill on AI, like on movies in general, to replace things that are made up stuff or just a placeholder, I think this will be uh, even more interesting. But thank you for answering my question in detail and I wish you the best. <laughs> thank you so much. And yeah, to, to echo Rhapsody's point, you know, video in painting, um, in manipulating an actual scene, like having a piece of footage and just like drawing a, a circle and being like, I want an explosion here or something like that. Like that is going to be a big part of the future of visual effects. And so we're just now beginning to see some of those 
uh, examples. Uh, I've, I've done some tests with Pika Labs. It's absolutely amazing, and, and it really does echo uh, the beginning of uh, what is going to be the, the future of, of visual effects. So very cool stuff. Uh, so we'll go to uh, Raven Hunter now. Uh, well, uh, just a quick question. Uh, what do you use to animate the mouths on your Pika videos? Yeah, you know, it's simple prompts, you know, like person talking, <laughs> things like that. Uh, and it, it does a good job. Uh, you know, obviously, it, again, it's an iterative process, so you may have to do a few renders to get the exact mouth movement that you're looking for. Um, but especially for kind of non-human characters, uh, Pika Labs is really the only tool that I can think of uh, that is uh, really helpful for generating those realistic uh, mouth movements. It's really uh, one of the areas that they, they shine. How do you match, let's say you use a voice from Eleven Labs, how do you match the mouth movement? Sorry, that, that's all my question. No, no, that's great. Uh, so uh, half of it is 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 editing. <laughs> so the interesting thing okay. is, yeah, with that bird, right, like it's a, a talking bird. <laughs> like <laughs> we have no idea like what the lip movements of a talking bird should look like. Um, and it, it was kind of similar to that new Dungeons and Dragons movie, the, the Jeremy bird <laughs> that they have, you know, yes. kind of this Jim Henson-esque, like just like large mouth movements that don't necessarily have to fully match. And so I think with the Zelda project, we specifically were able to to benefit from that. But um, it, yeah, it, it's editing, just cutting in and out, cutting to a reverse shot of the person, you know, listening to the person talking. You know, there are things that you have to work around at this point, but it's totally fine. All right, bye. Yeah, no problem. And you can use DID as well um, to do some like, you know, mouth movements and things like that. But it's uh, not not ideal. I, I, I think that the results you get from DID, unless you're compositing and going into a, a tool like After Effects or something like that, um, it's not um, it's not the most ideal. All right. Thank you. <laughs> no problem. All right. Along the board. How do I hang up? Oh, I actually have no idea. Hello. Hey, Caleb. Thanks for your presentation. Of course. Thank you. My question is, do you have any tips on keeping a consistency between shots and in the scene uh, regarding color and characters? Yeah. Yeah. That's those two things. I mean, this is like one of the bigger challenges with AI. So the first color that that really does coming come down to figuring out your prompt tags um, to include um, at the end of you know every image generation that you do. Um, so inside of Midjourney, there's a tool called uh, Prefer Suffix. So basically, um, you have the ability to save uh, a string of tags that will be appended to the end of every generation you create. And so what I like to do, I'll go back and forth with testing different styles. Like um, for the Star Wars scene, it was like um, uh, muted muted uh, gray color grading shot on an IMAX camera. Um, and then I think there was one more tag. And then once I realized like, oh, I really like this style, I appended that into the uh, the mid-journey prefer suffix tag. And then every generation I created had those tags at the end and it created the consistent color grading. For consistent characters, that's another thing. There's there's different things that you can do. Um, one is there's, there's some tools that are beginning to par- pop up um, like art flow is one of them where you literally can like take pictures of like for example yourself and then like prompt yourself um into uh scenes over and over again laura models and stable diffusion have been around for a while and it, it's much more technical but you can do it that way um as well and then you could also prompt generally for kind of who the person is and then face swap so for example with me with the ai film news segments like th- there's always like a face to, like it's like me like in like uh like uh, action movies and stuff like that. And we've basically had to figure out what is like my likeness? Like, who am I like? And you can use like AI tools to figure out uh, who your character is like. For me, it was like a 30-year-old Christoph Waltz. And so we'll uh, do like a, a 30, 30-year-old Christoph Waltz and then face swap and then like prompt for like brown hair and actually, I guess, increasingly gray hair. And uh, then we're we're good to go um, and uh, use insight face swap and, and tools like that. So uh, it's a back and forth. It does depend on your scene. I'm sure that these image generation tools, um, like you know, like Midjourney, uh, will um, have um, training models uh, in the very near future. But it's just uh, you know one of the the limitations that you have to work around right now. 
Awesome. Thank you. W- would you say it's just a couple of words then to be able to get the, the look you're going for? Because I've seen a lot of uh, prompts where it's like 20, 20 plus. Would you say the fewer has been the best? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. If you start typing in long prompts, will give you inconsistent results. So try to be as concise as possible. Um, there are um, some resources out there that can help you. I would say whenever I'm prompting, um, I the, the bulk of my prompt is going to be the direction, like the composition, what do I want to see, you know, what the action is, what the scene is like. And then I will briefly prompt in the, the color grading and the, the, the film stock and, and things like that towards the end. So I would say like a good prompt is probably no more than 20 words. Um, like when people like prompt like paragraphs, I'm always in like, they look amazing. It's just simply because I got lucky. Like the, there's no way they could reprompt with those paragraphs again and again, which is very important for us as filmmakers. <laughs> gotcha. Thank you. Appreciate you, Caleb. Yeah, of course. Thank you. All right. So we'll go to Beard Dreamer. Not sure if I'm saying that right. Hello? I think you're muted. If you're talking, I can't hear you. Just a heads up. Hello? Oh no, I don't think I can hear you. That's okay. Uh, What we'll do, we'll go to the next person and then... (laughs) Yeah. You heard his beard. <laughs> That's great. Uh, we'll go to Sin. Hi, Caleb. Hey there. Pleasure to be here. Your presentation. Thank you so much. Um, I've recently signed up for the class. And I don't know when I had so much fun. <laughs> um, it's, it's an absolute fun class. I've learned a, a lot of new things. There's so many new tools, and I get fun playing with a lot of them. Um, But I do have a question with animation. Um, I see a lot of students are doing this sci-fi and all that, but I chose to go in a slightly different direction uh, with a cartoon thing. Is the best tool um, the Wonder Studio or Pika for what I wanted to do? Because I have a flat character, but I'd like to turn that character 3D. Mm -hmm. Yep. So you have a flat character you want to turn 3D. Is this flat character, did you draw this character or, or it's like an image from like a, an AI tool? I Yes, I used all the AI tools, all of which are brand new for me. Uh, this yeah. week I learned how to use mid-journey. I learned how to use uh, prompts. I learned from others. Um, so I did prompt some characters um, in a Pixar style. Great. And, you know, I had to keep messing with it. Um, I used several different tools. I used um, Dolly. I used Chat GPT four. Yeah. Um, recently, I'm dipping into Runway. Um, a lot of amazing tools. Um, so now I'd like to know. Um, I'd like to get that animated. Um, and I was wondering if those, if the three D motion um, Wonder Studio, if that's like really difficult because I'm just starting out, um, or is it possible to drop those characters in there and do it that way? Or is there a Pika program or I'm going to have to do it like piece by piece by piece and build it? Yeah. Well, there's there's entirely different options for you. Uh, so Wonder Studio, <clears throat> excuse me, Wonder Studio, like what you're talking about, just so um, everyone is on the same page, is the tool where you basically can shoot reference footage and then you just drag and drop basically a 3D model and it converts the person that was in your footage into a 3D model. And you can either, you know, just have that that uh, 3D model comped into the actual scene that you shot, or you can just take that data and put it into a 3D application like Blender or, you know, Cinema 4D, Maya, whatever 3D tool you want. Um, that tool is awesome. Uh, but uh, there that is significantly more work than simply taking the images and prompting. I think it really just depends on how dynamic and how refined you want your final piece to be. So if this is just like a pitch trailer or a project for kids, you could probably get away with just using uh, images and then prompting either in mid journey or um, in some of those other tools, like I was talking about, like Artflow that allows you to train it on a character and get those consistent renders over and over again. 
versus having to go now, you know, now you're new to mid journey and then you have to go learn a 3D application. It might be a, a little much. So I would probably say if it's okay to, to have the quality not be quite, you know, silver screen ready, uh, you could probably go with the, the image uh, to video models like we talked about today. Um, but you know, it, you you absolutely could learn uh, 3D uh, tools like Blender pretty quickly. You know, it'd probably take a good month to to be like really confident and up to speed. Um, but you know, if if it was a, a professional project, you might want to go that route as well. Okay, thank you. Yeah, um, and then uh, you know we'll. Go ahead. I had one more question. Like for instance, if you wanted to have um, a dead branch grow a leaf, and you wanted to do it cartoon style. Mm -hmm. Pika would do that or the other one? Yeah. So you could try it in Pika. I think, you know, you could, I would do that in reverse. So what I would do is have like uh, the image generated with like a, a, a leaf on it. And then I would probably in paint. So use the the tool inside of Pika to, to remove that section. And then I would say like a leaf retracts or something like that. It might be a little bit easier than the leaf like being born and then play the footage in reverse <laughs> once you, you get it. Uh yeah, a lot of times we we do that with visual effects um, at Curious Refuge. We'll actually do the scene in reverse and then uh, play it. In, well, well, we'll prompt it in reverse and then reverse that footage, and then it looks like it's real time. It sometimes is better uh, to go backwards like that. Got it. Thank you. Yeah, of course. All right, guys. So we'll take like maybe one or two more uh, questions. Or if uh, that's the last one, I mean, we're right at an hour. So if anyone has a last minute question or request, feel free to hop in. Uh, so we'll see. David. David? Oh, wow. Lots of AI puns. That's great. One last question. All right, David. You're our last one. You should be able to join now. Okay, can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay, cool. Because I, I just asked the whole question, but I'll start over. Um, so it, on your projects and like with what Dave Clark's doing, because he comes from traditional filmmaking, are you storyboarding those out? Like you're scripting them out and storyboarding them out, and then do you start piecing it together in the editor with um with like your still images, and then and then animating those still images it, like through Pika. Yeah, I mean, like, what's the workflow there? Yeah, that's that's helpful. I I actually do find so uh, I didn't talk about this in the presentation, but this is a a great point. Um, sometimes, and it does depend on the project. Sometimes it's better to start with the images and the audio, and then work with the video as opposed to just starting with the video. That, that's a very different workflow from like a professional workflow because usually it's like you have the footage and you need to work around the footage. Um, but I, because sound is so important uh, for AI projects, a lot of times we'll make like a radio version and then we'll take images and like cut into that radio version and then we'll go into the video tools to generate the videos we'll drop them into our timeline you know iterate go back and forth and then when we're happy with the low res version we'll then take all those video clips and up res them in topaz video so there's a lot of different um like th there's steps there but we like kind of treating it more like a radio drama first and then in a slideshow and then a, a low res video, and then a high res film, right? So, um, it's it's an iterative process, but that's yeah, generally it's really works. helpful because it's kind of the music and, and the audio is obviously critical to the whole thing, and so you've got to cut your videos to match your audio. So, yeah, that's really helpful. Thank you. Of course, yeah, and and that's if I could give anybody like some advice here, it's absolutely focus on your audio, guys. I think a, a lot of folks like spend so much time getting the visuals together but then they just slap on just some random song with no care to like how it cuts to the music or anything like that so um spend some time uh and, and please okay this is like my my pro tip people uh who uh master cds do this as well but like listen to your audio on your phone or off your laptop and not just your headphones before you publish it. Most people that consume your film, is they're going to do it in a less than ideal medium. And a lot of times your headphones can make something sound completely different than what it sounds like to the average viewer. So be sure to preview it on kind of like a lesser <laughs> acoustic environment 
uh, before you you launch. I hear so many projects where like the music is just way too loud. You can't hear what the people are saying. So uh, yeah, just think about that. <laughs> All right, guys. Well, thank you so much for joining us for this live stream. I, I'd like to extend a huge thank you to Pika Labs for inviting me on. I uh, had a really great time uh, and would love to uh, come back maybe in the future. Um, of course, if you guys want to uh, learn more about Curious Refuge, you can check us out at CuriousRefuge.com. Uh, we have AI film news coming out in just a couple hours. There's a ton of new updates. Uh, you can check that out on our YouTube channel. And um, yeah, thank you uh, so much. Uh, love the encouragement. And uh, if you guys uh, happen to be um, at one of the uh, AI filmmaking events out in LA or um, in Europe, uh, be sure to check our, out our uh, events page. Uh, there's a good chance we may be there. So Thank you guys so much and uh, yeah, have a wonderful weekend. Bye.